That we are that living, we are living profoundly altered by human influence is no longer a speculative issue. The facts and figures of anthropogenic environmental change daily rehearsed in news outlets and on social media illustrate, among other things, climate changes, sea level rises, severe weather events, polluted living conditions, growing mountains of toxic waste, and extinction level losses of biodiversity. Environmental change is registering now two in international treatises, religious encyclicals, global activist action, and national legislation. The implications of environmental change and its storied manifestations are, borrowing the words of Dr. Ian Bauckham, deeply connected to what it means to be human on Earth in the 21st century. In the so-called age of the Anthropocene, the planet's wealthiest and most educated humans have, through our daily acts of modern living, accelerated climate change more than 170 times its natural pace. And our blind adoption of techno-reproduction is the apex of human progress we have sentenced ourselves to lives lived with those technologies and the implications of their geophysical wastes. Despite claims that technology will save us from ourselves, our technosphere is in fact partly, if not largely, to blame for our current environmental condition. Digital systems and networked technologies now embody an increasingly agentive ecological sphere, what environmental engineer Dr. Peter Half calls the technosphere. The technosphere and half's configuration is the physical layer of technological accumulation that now blankets the earth. As an earth scientist, Dr. Half's task had traditionally been to isolate elements in their purity in order to understand them better. Not so long ago, he realized that there are no longer any geophysically pure elements. Everything is now touched by human and most particularly human technological intervention. The digital sphere includes now billions of devices, big and small, millions if not billions of servers sitting in millions of data centers around the world. It includes too a massive infrastructure of wires and undersea sea cables. There are no satellites despite the airy metaphors of the cloud. The technosphere also includes enormous piles of e-waste, unpaid or underpaid workers, and an unruly amount of toxic pollution, wasted clean water, and ecological destruction. On top of that, this technosphere has a hungry appetite for energy. The cloud alone uses more energy than most countries. New projected estimates of the energy consumption of technologies like Bitcoin suggest this might steadily increase if we do not pivot quickly toward renewables. Our emails, spam messages, Facebook likes, and online searches all have carbon footprints as well. Most people are pretty surprised by this, and understandably so. We are told to think before we print, but not told to think before we send an email. Despite claims that the web is clean and green, the majority of the energy it still uses comes from coal and dirty fossil fuels. The carbon footprint of the digital sphere now rivals and is set to soon surpass the carbon footprint of the aviation industry. The ecological footprint of the device we use to navigate the web, even before we turn the device on, is also staggering. Its transportation footprint is equally so. Edward Humes, in his 2016 book, Door to Door, calculates that the transportation footprint of a single mobile phone, before it even gets to your pocket, is equivalent to a round trip voyage to the moon. It is reported that there are now more active cellular phones in use than there are human bodies on the planet. And that by 2020, our vast network of networking devices is estimated to reach 26 billion units. It is these physical things, not immaterial magic clouds that constitute the digital universe. This is the technosphere. Technosphere began when the earth became irreparably impure and technology became metabolically entangled with the human and the precarious environmental balance of our earthly habitat. Myriad digital media studies detail how the digital systems that network the earth are actively altering human societies, but my project is something different. It shifts the digital media focus from one grounded in computation to one fully rooted in the earth. Despite the obvious materialities of digital technology, classical humanist discourse, with only a represent, representative handful of clear exceptions, more or less neglects this in favor of focusing on the affective nature of the digital universe. My research then looks at the environmental effects of digital technologies. The materiality and environmentality of the digital world are not only largely overlooked by most of us, but are also deliberately hidden. Our devices are sold to us as magical. Our data is stored in a cloud. Smartphones are so insignificant in material value that you can trade in for a new one every year for free because two years is too long to wait, right? 
For MIT's Sherry Turkle, whose scholarship has been publicly promoted through TED Talks and NPR spots, our phones are like phantom limbs. They are felt, but not physically present. Internet scholars like Barabasi sell us this image of the internet as an ungrounded blob of connections. Other scholars of 21st century living have equated the digital to the algorithmic. It's numbers all the way down, they say. Contemporary literature has given us the term cyberspace and put it in opposition to meat space. All of these figurations abstract the digital to code or affect or disembodied edges and nodes. They are all telling immaterial stories that I argue only work to support the ungrounded nature of our digital technologies. A story told is always another story untold and those untold stories are the narratives I tend to. The immaterial affective algorithmic stories are the stories my research works against. When we believe the immaterial stories we are told, we forget the beginnings, the ends, and the material middles. My research has thus focused on bringing wires, workers, warehouses, and waste back into the digital narrative. These are digital media's beginnings, middles, and ends. I began my project by positing the idea of a digital metabolism as a framework that might, if it were adopted by those of us who talk about digital media and culture, help us remember the material environmental effects of the digital sphere. Metabolic thinking links, links bodies, technological and otherwise, to the planet. We know this, right? The earth provides the food that fuels us and we produce waste that returns to the earth. This is the metabolic process. The everyday process of eating links us to soils and plants and to the waste removal systems we've created. It also links us to the pollutants and chemicals ingested by the foods we eat. Metabolic thinking gives us a rather radically ecosystemic way of looking at our bodies and our ecological connections. Metabolic processes inherently bind together a variety of living systems. When we apply this metabolic lens to the digital sphere then, we move away from thoughts of the digital as immaterial or magical, simply affective or algorithmic, and we begin to see things differently. Digital metabolism then for me is a concept of co-living, of overlapping and interlocking systems. Thinking metabolically means that when we look at our phones, those that most of us have in our pockets and purses, we see these lines of flight backward to the minds and forward to their waist. It means too that we see how we are ecosystemically connected through our devices and digital use to labor, pollution, minerals, and environmental upset in all corners of the globe. The side effects of digital technologies that should concern us are not so much those that alter our dinner table etiquette, as folks like Sherry Turkle are prone to warn, but those that are irreversibly altering our bodies and our planetary habitats. If we want to talk about the effects the digital has on the human, we must talk about the mineral, material, and energetic natures of the technosphere. Reading the rubbish of our te everyday techno-cultural lives is an eco-critical project. Whereas others may read stories of the affect over algorithmic nature of 21st century living, I read the environmental stories our digital artifacts have to tell. The story I tell is one of inherent interdependence and inseparability between the human, the environment, and technology. I take seriously anthro anthropologist Marilyn Strathern's claim that it matters what ideas we use to think other ideas with. It matters, as Haraway says, which stories story our stories. If narratives, grand, modest, meta, and mediated shape the ways we understand the world, re-narrating is less an exercise in thinking and more a crucial reframing for life, live, and anthropocene futures. My current book project asks how an environmental humanities perspective, one that foregrounds the physical environmental aspect of digital media's infrastructure, can contribute to the reconfiguration of media theory's most prominent frameworks by drawing attention to the discourses that prevent a robust environmental media studies. It argues we must re-story digital materiality to help narrate unseen relationships and articulate alternate futures. It refigures the environmental metaphors already present in media theory, and we like to use terms like the cloud, atmospheric media, and media ecology that actually have nothing to do with the earth. It reconfigures these terms to embed them concretely within their earthly material contexts. Thinking about the concept of digital memory, for instance, not as one of these guys, but as the traces our unsustainable digital consumption is leaving on the earth, recontextualizes our digital notions. Digital fossils will not be those instantiated in data on hard drives or memory sticks. They'll be left as physical traces on our bodies and the earth. 
but we archive as sedimentary layers. I see the Anthropocene not only a as a story about the past, but also to one we are telling about our futures. Plasticlomerate, for instance, is a new type of geological formation made when waste plastics fuse to ocean sands. Plasticlomerate is, in a sense, digital memory. Philosopher Rosie Berdotti says, the lack of concepts and terminology to deal with the ecological environment and non-human others is a serious deficit in view of the mutation we are experiencing toward the Anthropocene predicament. The hope then, and grounding our terminology, like figuring digital memory not only as memory saved on disks, but as traces left on the earth, is that new stories will inspire new ways of thinking. I told my students last week, each time we define something, and in class I give them the impossible task of defining nature, our definition both opens and closes possibilities. It opens and closes new stories. In my project, I propose permaculture, a profoundly interconnected set of ethical design principles I borrow from natural farming, and eco-critical digital humanities as ethical and active practical skill sets that might unhinge dominant forms of doing in digital and cultural humanities scholarship especially those that either deliberately or unknowingly support ungrounded digital motifs, to provide a richer and more engaged framework for literary, media, and humanities practice. Part of that work is practicing greener scholarship and more sustainable digital technology use. The eco-activist in me wants to leave you with a call to action and examples for this. So I have a, I have a numbered list here of examples we can use as models for greener tech use. We can practice thoughtful searching. Instead of using Google search, I use Ecosia, a carbon neutral search engine that donates 80% of its ad revenue to plant trees. I have installed tab for a cause from Gladly, and each time I open a new browser tab, and I love my tabs, I am generating points that translate into small donations that go to an environmental charity. I have 3D printed my internet browsing data waste as a digital research experiment to explore and visualize the data traces I leave as I surf the web and to better understand the weight and space my data takes up. I have organized events like the Eco Critical Digital Humanities Symposium Stuart Varner and I organized recently, which explored the overlaps between digital scholarship and environmental justice. I try to create carbon light websites, and there's a great video on this and sustainable UX's archives. I am practicing conscientious data saving and I'm trying to lessen data saving in the cloud. Just dumping my spam folder and any unneeded emails helps reduce my data load and thus the data center space energy I'm consuming and thus my digital carbon footprint. And I believe the presentation just before mine mentioned a lot of things you can do there. In addition, I am letting go of unused websites and unused pages on websites. I think of it as an energy audit for my data load. I try to stream less. <clears throat> In many cases, streaming video is actually less green than buying CDs, DVDs, and yes, physical books. <coughs> Excuse me. I use devices longer and buy conscientiously. Yes, this is my phone. I can't bear to replace it until it actually needs replacing. I charge efficiently. There is research that says proper charging practices can extend the lives of our batteries. I have tasked myself with learning the art and activism of repair. I plan to begin a project soon to learn to fix the start button on a broken iPhone I've adopted. Recycling is not enough. We must reduce, reuse, and repair. I am toying with the idea of creating DIY solar cell phone chargers with my students. I am brainstorming several new public humanities data projects with EcoData to see how I might use data for good. <clears throat> I teach digital materiality. Many of us teach our students to be good stewards of their digital data and online persona. We teach them to be careful about what they post publicly because our data leaves traces, right? But we do not, not often teach them about being good stewards of their physical devices. <clears throat> the lovely thing I found is that even in my techie digital humanities courses, the digital materiality sections most excite the students. My students even created a poster. So these are just a few of many ways you can go green with your digital use and scholarship. And I encourage each, each of you to seek out methods that might work best for you. I hope you'll consider this presentation an invitation to act. And know that individual acts are not futile. In fact, studies have proven otherwise. Eco actions like installing solar panels, using cloth bags at the market, 
and driving electric cars have been seen as contagious. Once you install solar panels, your neighbors are more likely to do so. Permaculture champions small, slow changes. So I challenge you then to maybe adopt at least one of these ways to reduce your trace. The digital humanities need not be so dirty. Thank you. <coughs> Thank you, Amanda. Wonderful talk. I especially liked your phone. Excuse my coughing along the way. <laughs> oh, you were fine. You were fine. It it's was that great. time of year, right? <laughs> thank you so much. Well, thank you for having me, and thank you for having this conference. Very important information all throughout. Absolutely. And you, your contributions are much appreciated. Thank you so much. Okay. Okay. So we are going to take a brief break while um, while we queue up our next presenters. So they are scheduled to go on at 12.15. So we are going to 